Hey, this is Chad Warren. I uh, want to introduce a couple clips. One by Greg McCarran over at the Antidote channel on YouTube, as well as another by Harry Schlanger, who is connected to the LaRouche conservative organization. And what I want you to focus on is that the problem with the republic in America is that it's fake. Okay? So, Greg, who works with another guy named Jeremy Roth Cashel, they do an excellent job of tracking politics in America and especially the Russian and uh, Israeli uh, connections uh, as well as you know the uh, Christian conservative evangelical influence of uh, Zionism on the world uh, and they were at <coughs> the recent oh what do you call them the primaries. So, in in this video, Greg is talking about Rush Limbaugh, who was celebrated by President Trump at his recent State of the Union address as this hero of America. And. Rush has switched, and this is what Greg is focusing on, so that now he says that Bush was uh, lied to about WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, in the Gulf War, which is what caused that war to happen, is that we were lied to, which is completely ridiculous because his frickin' dad was, like, big time in the CIA. So, I mean... If, if that's true, then that is this huge failure in the intelligence community, okay? Now, the failure in the intelligence community I want to focus on is with us, the little people, okay? So, I think there's huge problems, but they're very simple as far as a concept, and they don't get addressed that way, and that's my intention with this video, is to get you to think about this. I think everything's overcomplicated. Just in, in communication in general. So that really all of this geopolitics can be reduced down into like a sentence. You don't need to go to school Yes, it helps to know all these specifics, so that, but that's just tracking what you, you know at a heart level, okay, from your own personal experience. You have to balance those two things, your own personal, anecdotal life experience with all of this data. Or else you end up in a church of high priests of science, just like you end up in a church of high priests of religion. So, it's simply matter versus spirit. Uh, or another way to put it would be, it's not fair to critique the assholes that run the world, okay? Because assholes depend on weak people. You see? The good people that, are, that have the, the intention to do the right thing, but don't have the discipline. We are the problem with all of this. Okay? Uh, is somebody forcing us to go into credit debt? Are they forcing us to get student loans? Are they forcing us to watch pornography? Are they forcing us to drink alcohol? Are they forcing us to take prescription drugs? No. There's a lot of persuasive manipulation. 
but it doesn't matter if there is this eugenics program by the elites. There's always been that program. And I think that, that we know ourselves I, in my daily life. You know what I mean? Like my life, I would rate as a total failure. I would rate, I would rate the whole alternative media as a total failure. What is talking about any of this doing about anything? We're, we're screwed on two levels. Number one, we can't understand the, the, the concepts, right, so that people accept Donald Trump as a conservative, and he's not. It's a fake republic. They're, they're going to say fake news, but yet they won't ever analyze their own point of view. You see how dangerous that is? Yes, it's very easy to make fun of the left. They're obviously screwed in this presidential election. They're, they're divided amongst themselves. Uh, but, I, you know, my uh, Briggs Myers personality is, is the debater. Okay? So, you know... Uh, you're going to have to learn all of these different positions because just by uh, the, the balance of math and nature, you know, there's night and there's day. Everything comes from the same source. So all of these different positions ha are derivative from each other. You can't exclude any of them. You know what I mean? I may not want to commit suicide and think it's terrible, but you can't just hate on that. You know what I mean? You have to respect, hey, life sucks. What is the point? Gee, I, I don't know. You know, you have to be vulnerable if you want to get to any kind of truth. So that's the biggest problem that I see is that people are hypocritical and they don't criticize their own point of view. Is any where is any voice within the conservative party that criticizes Trump? Uh, Greg mentions uh, Ann Coulter, who has been critical that he hasn't built the wall and things like that. But you know, this is just not going to work. A a a representative, you know. A republic is about the best leading the rest, but it's about them representing our argument. You see what I mean? So we have to be leading, uh, even if there are people that are smarter and, and more talented and, and richer than us. You see what I'm saying? Like, I mean, look at uh, Michael Bloomberg. Does it matter how much money he has? I mean, he's not going to win. So obviously there's some need for uh, to change our uh, point of view and our behavior. So obviously that matters. And we do have control over that. But uh, we're not going to get anything done being isolated in these different groups that can't uh, get along. And there are historical examples uh, you know, that the different uh, Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam do have a, a justice, you know, honorable aspects of themselves, and they have dishonorable aspects of themselves, which of course... Um, and evidently that's a part of artificial intelligence, as these... Uh, AI that have been designed have, you know, been very vindictive and racist. So, the deep state, okay, is a lot older than Trump, and uh, it's a lot older than Bush. It's a lot older than the... Uh, JFK assassinations or the Lincoln assassination. I mean, my big hunch is that America never was really f 
this constitutional republic, okay, it was run by aristocrats. A very few people, you know, just like always, persuade the majority into action. So until, you know, you're going to listen to Mr. Schlanger explain that the Venetian oligarchs are the same people that rule today through subversion, and they said they had a republic, but it wasn't a republic, right? Just like this alt-right is also controlled by the same subversive tactics that uh, created uh, the Soviet Union. And it's not of any value to talk about nations, because nations are not controlled by their people. You see, uh, if you understand the argument that, well, you know, both uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are controlled by special interests, rich people, then you should understand that the nations, likewise, are all controlled by rich people that exist beyond the laws of nations. They all put their money in Swiss bank accounts. They, Amazon doesn't have to pay any taxes. Uh, has the city of London and so none of these financial rules apply laws apply to these elites and it doesn't matter what happens to Jeffrey Epstein and, and Harvey Weinstein uh, or, or the Rockefellers or Rothschilds they are, they are so much the, the front of these moneyed families of Europe, which, you know, come on, haven't we all seen the video where the young woman in, like, the seventh grade did a science project and shows that all of these world leaders and celebrities, they're all connected to these uh, royal bloodline families? I mean, the problem is with us. So, you, we're going to have to do a reset and, and research what is Plato's Republic. And then the, the simpler aspect is that it's the part of us that wants to make short-term decisions based on a lack of trust and love. Uh, uh, you know, choosing to drink a, a, a tall boy of Miller High Life when you don't have any money to your name to get through the night. Those are the kind of decisions that end up affecting the whole world. We, our individual life of corruption is not something that we need to lecture each other about, right? We all know when we are being divisive and uh, ignoring the truth because it's uncomfortable. So that's the solution. And I would appreciate it if you would check these two segments out and go to their channels and let them know, hey, uh, you know, Chad Warren, he was talking about y'all, uh, Will, and uh, we're going to have to build a confederacy both online within this video community, and we're going to have to start learning about, I'm going to have to learn about local community, not just politics, but, uh, you know, how can we loan money to each other instead of going to banks? How can we uh, buy groceries together up at the Sam's Club to save some money? You know what I mean? The problem is with our behavior. So thank you very much, and enjoy. Branding. You know, Ann Coulter still, I guess, talks the same as she used to. Now she's just using her rhetoric to criticized Trump when she was one of the major figures who helped get Trump elected with her, um, you know, very much using her platform to shill for Trump at all costs. And then you've got Rush Limbaugh, who's now rewriting his own history and the history of the Bush administration to fit the narrative that Trump is uh, being persecuted. And who does this benefit? I mean, who is Rush Limbaugh benefiting when he does this? I mean, I think he's benefiting the same people that were benefiting from the partisanship of the Clinton era, when Limbaugh was the big 
radio fire and partisan voice uh, that was supposed to be against the Clintons, but was actually really doing nothing to actually expose the uh, the Clintons and their criminality. Or during the Bush era, when Trump, when Russia uh, was the biggest, I would say, within conservative media purveyor of the lies of the. Uh, 11 and then of course the Obama administration more the same usual partisanship and with some dog whistling against Obama and his administration and now with Trump where he's pushing the idea of where he's a primary pusher of the heroic Trump fighting the evil elite Democrat served um, during previous administrations that is the goals of this uh, obvious, very um, Likudnik, uh, neoconservative element, both here in the U.S. and also in Israel, that benefits from, that obviously benefited from September 11th, benefited from the war in Iraq, benefited from the uh, global war on terror in general, and are now benefiting under Trump, who has done so many things for Israel that no other president in history would do, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, recognizing the Golan Heights as belonging to Israel, signing this... Um, you know, executive order on anti-Semitism on college campuses, and then um, also given the green light to unlimited uh, settlement. Though these are things that other presidents wouldn't sign off on, and you know Trump's doing that. He is the Zionist Israeli dream, and also I would say Limbaugh is continuing to serve the purposes of uh, of this bigger quote conservative movement through um, through the Council for National Policy, which Limbaugh I believe has long been affiliated with, uh, maybe directly at times and certainly indirectly via a larger network of conservative activists that are that have been on the scene for a long time. I mean, same goes for uh, same goes for Ann Coulter, and same goes for Tucker Carlson as well. But I mean, it's this, you know, John Brisson, my friend uh, John Brisson, we've read the documents, has, uh, has documented so thoroughly um, the Council for National Policy and how it just brings all of these various uh, movements within the bigger conservative uh, Republican apparatus together and Limbaugh I think is simultaneously serving the you know there's a lot of tie-ins with the uh, you know the whole dominionist uh, evangelical um, sector and the you know the Israeli Zionist as they see like the pushing for Israel and Judeo-Christian values is a major part of their of their uh, crusade their worldview vision, of course, things like uh, Rush Limbaugh weaponizing the term feminazi and some of the talking points as far as the social wars go, culture wars go, has really um, contributed to those efforts, just meaning anybody who is opposed to any type of uh, right-wing culture war rhetoric or policy as just being uh, unhinged, loony leftists. He still does that to this day. He's been doing that for 30 years now. And also, obviously, uh, Council for National Policy, who I believe the big wigs at the very top, who did uh, approve of the Bush presidency, were very approving of the war on terror and continued to be, and ultimately rallied around Trump, even if they did not initially support him, as the initial support was more with uh, Ted Cruz, I believe, but did rally around Trump rather unanimously in the lead-up to the 2016 election and have stayed by his side ever since. And ultimately, a primary goal at the very top of, um, of this of this whole Council for National Policy conservative uh, right-wing uh, leadership is this desire to keep alive this two-party political system, keep us within the Republicans and the Democrats. Don't look for outside solutions. Uh, I mean, you know, John Brisson was playing so what he called America's grandmother. He's saying that, you know, she doesn't support third parties. It's Republican or Democrat, and we don't have any other real options, so we need to support one of the two parties. I mean, when you look at what the way Limbaugh weaponizes his rhetoric, it's all about the left. It's all about the liberals. It's all about right versus left. I mean, you can see right there, I mean, Limbaugh wants to keep his listenership. And again, Limbaugh is talking to the actual meat and potatoes, the conservative base with his radio show, with his narratives he pushes out and obviously very much the goal, one of the major goals is to keep people in this left right paradigm which is a primary goal of both people within the republican establishment and the democratic establishment and now limbaugh is using um simply the narrative has changed a little bit because the president is now trump it's no longer bush or obama or clinton but he's serving the same role as a partisan 
hack operative in the way he words things and the way he just blames the other side for all of our problems. And so I wanted to take some time to read from that story and comment on it because it's amazing how Rush Limbaugh is just uh, is changing history. And I'd say this is pretty brazen of him. This is pretty uh, – I mean this is something else that he would come out with this talking point. It's amazing, just rewriting of history, the rewriting of the Bush administration, and using – the, using this rewritten, revised history on Bush to as a means to defend Trump. It's pretty amazing. And as I said, I'm not surprised. I mean, cancer has not changed the man. And of course, it's not even really Spain. It's Spain under the influence of Venice. And finally, to give you a sense of the setting for Othello, this is maybe hard to see, but this is, the Venetians have just won a battle at sea. And here you see people carrying a, a, uh, carrying a, a platform on which the Doge and his wife are sitting and his relatives. And the people are cheering, but what are they cheering? They're throwing coins to the poor. Because the ruling elite in Venice were among the most brutal, the most murderous, that the holy days in Venice were always days where people would go to mass balls, and the day after you'd find bodies in the lagoons, in the, the canals. And so you get a sense of this idea that, that's there in the, uh, in the Bravo and in the Dossi or in the Othello. This idea of a people for whom the manipulation for personal or familial power is primary. And it's from this standpoint that you look at the key character in the play Othello, and you find it's not Othello, but it's a character by the name Iago. And Iago represents, and I think, I hope we can demonstrate this as we discuss the play, the Venetian method. So let me stop with that, and uh, I know I threw out a lot of years of history, but I think that this is crucial for people to get a sense of how civilizations develop and what the fights are. And if you think this through and go back over your notes, and then think about what Nick presented earlier, I think you'll get a very good sense that this crowd we're fighting today is the same Venetian crowd transplanted to Harvard, Stanford, and a few places like that. But we know how to defeat them. It's to use a good, healthy dose of platonic thinking. So let me open the floor for questions. Well, the idea of a republic, or the idea of a nation state, is that you have institutions of government which are dedicated to the common good. And the idea that by improving the conditions of all you actually improve the conditions of the whole nation. Now, it's not just some abstract philosophical concept, but if you have an economy, and this is LaRouche's concept of the common good, an economy which reflects these principles, what it means is that through the development of new technologies, parallel to the development of a higher living standard and educational standard of the population, that you're increasing the power over nature per capita and per square kilometer of the whole society. Which means that, quite simply, in a nation with a lot of poor people, if you're really interested in improving the strength of that nation, you have to have an economic policy and an education policy which simultaneously increases the creative power of that population so that they're able to do more work, more productive work. A population of slave laborers may keep a few people rich, but the society as a whole is weak. So if you're a, a, a parasitical elite like the Venetian oligarchy, how do you survive? You have to keep all the rest of the world fighting. You get vassal states that go out and do the battles for you. The reason the Venetians went to England is after, I should have mentioned this, after 1511, 
They knew that they just lucked out in the fight against the League of Cambrai. They knew that that strategic location in the Adriatic was not a good location to run a world empire. And so they chose, they looked around the world and they said, where could we be to best run a world empire? And they chose London, England, the, the British Isles. Now, the common good, the, common, the general welfare, is a simple concept. You have government that's committed to ensuring the best protection of the population. Protection, as Machiavelli said, from special interests. Now, that's the idea of our founding fathers, of Lincoln, of Franklin Roosevelt, of Lyndon LaRouche. Now, what's the idea of someone like George W. Bush to the extent he has a political idea? <laughs> if my friends who are better people than yours because they're part of the elect, see, look at Bush's religious view. He thinks because he overcame cocaine and alcohol problems by humbling himself, falling on his knees before God and begging for forgiveness, that now he's become one of the elect. He's like I'm one of these guys, I'm on a mission from God to destroy terrorism. And so you get these controllers who are much more clever than him, and they say, we've identified the greatest terrorist threat in the world, it's Saddam Hussein. And Bush, like his father, is saying, well, we got to go after the Hitler. And Robert Shear wrote a hilarious column today in the L.A. Times. He said, this Saddam Hussein, he just proved why he's called the new Hitler. Look what he just did. He agreed to, to his unconditional acceptance of U.N. resolutions. What a dastardly character. <laughs> now, Bush, with the conviction of a born-again Christian, is saying, well, I don't care if he has these if there's no evidence of the weapons, that means he's more clever than we thought. <laughs> Therefore, we have to go even more aggressively to get rid of them. And anybody who won't is an enemy of ours. So you have the general welfare on the one hand, which starts by saying, look, suppose Saddam Hussein is the worst guy in the world. You want to have peace in the Middle East? What's the best way to do it? You start with Palestine. You start with an Israeli-Palestinian agreement. Now, people who are stupid about this because they've been manipulated around the idea of the Holocaust and uh, guilt over the Holocaust and you can't criticize Israel because of the Holocaust and all this crap. Well, let's take a place that doesn't have many Jews. Korea. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that that's good or bad not having Jews. They just don't have it. But Korea had a war going on between North and South for 55 years. Now, what just happened in, in Korea? They're going to rebuild North Korea. They're going to have railroads. They're going to have economic development. The Japanese apologized to the North Koreans. The North Koreans apologized to the Japanese. And today, they tore down the barbed wire that's been there since, I think, 1948. And they drove the first stake in the high-speed rail it's going to connect the southern tip of South Korea with Paris, France, going through North Korea. Woo. And who did it? One of the leaders of one of the axis of evil countries, North Korea. Once again, Bush was outfoxed. These damn axis of evil countries are getting pretty smart. Well, he's used to finding out that other people are clever. No, he usually doesn't find it out. <laughs> you don't think someone's going to tell him that, do you? Condi Rice is going to go in and say, oh, Mr. President, we were outsmarted by that tin horn dictator, Kim Jong-il. Well, of course not. Here, I, look, here's the funny thing. Last week, Koizumi, who's one of the worst leaders of a nation, the, the Prime Minister of Japan, do you know what he was doing last week, a week ago today? He was at a Boston Red Sox game with Bush Sr. Now, a year earlier, he was at a Baltimore Orioles game with Bush Jr. So the Bushes think the way you get along with the Japanese is you take them to a ball game, especially if there's a Japanese player on one of the teams. And you say, well, your people are getting pretty good for those little dark people you are. Pretty soon you'll be up to our little brown people from the United States, you know, the ones we let in from Latin America because they can feel you know, the Bush view of the world. 
Now, here's Koizumi, who acts like an idiot on economics. He acts like an idiot on most things, and he acted like a statesman in North Korea. So why can't we do that in the Middle East? Well, Rabin wanted to. Rabin represents the real Jewish tradition, the recognition that it's through treating your fellow human beings with justice that's the basis for peace. And so Rabin said, look, I've been killing you Palestinians for 30 years. We still don't have peace. You don't have dignity. We don't have peace. Let's try it differently. That's what Oslo was about. And Rabin was murdered by the people who work with Sharon, the people in the Sharon government. And Sharon is saying, yeah, we're going to have peace. We're going to have the peace over your dead bodies. Again, you have the general welfare versus the Venetian concept of an oligarch. The Israelis, and I don't mean all Israelis, the leadership in Israel today is a bunch of psychopaths who came out of this Jabotinsky wing of, of the Zionist movement, which wanted an alliance with Adolf Hitler. They appealed to Hitler. They said, if you drop your anti-Semitism, we'll join you in the war against Britain. And these are the people Bush talks about as the men of peace of Israel. The ones who killed the actual peace-loving Israelis, Rabin, who was part of this tradition, the better tradition, the Moses Mendelssohn tradition of Judaism. So if you look at this thing, you take the best of Judaism, the best of Christianity, the best of Islam, and it's all based on a concept of justice and human dignity. Now, can you have peace among the faiths based on that? Of course you can. Can you have peace among the faiths when you say Islam, radical Islam, is an anti-human tendency? As Bush is saying? Yeah, Nick. Uh, that was the... It wasn't Israel, it's this faction in Israel. Because here's what happened. Bush was putting enormous pressure on Shamir. Shamir, Yitzhak Shamir, was the, the head of something called the Stern Gang in the 1940s. The Stern Gang was a bunch of terrorists. These are the guys who, who were killing... Brits, they were killing Palestinians, they were killing Jews who didn't agree with the Jabotinskyites. This was the radical terrorist wing of the Jabotinskyites. It was Shamir's close friend who went to negotiate with Hitler to form this alliance. Now, when Shamir was prime minister, here you have the irony. These guys were a tiny, tiny grouping within the Zionist movement. Most Jews hated them. The Jews who liked them in the United States were the gangsters like Meyer Lansky, like Mickey Cohen, who ran the, the rackets out here, who raised money from rich Jews to provide arms for Israel, and then he claimed that the ship sank. But most people knew he just kept the money. <laughs> it's the California Attorney General's report from 1944. It says, we don't think they ever bought the arms. You know, they're not above exploiting anybody. Anyway, this network, uh, the, the, the other guy, Bagan, Bagan was the other Jabotinskyite, and he headed up something called the uh, You're Good. Bagan was, his group blew up the King David Hotel, which killed almost 80 people in 1947, or 40, maybe it was 45. Anyway, this was an act of terrorism greater than anything done by uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad. So these two terrorists formed a party, which in the 60s merged and was called the Likud. This is the Jabotinskyites. And because of the crisis in Israel in the 70s, they came to power. And it was a, a coordinated operation. This was Kissinger's operation. This is the Brzezinski operation. And what they were saying is that, look,